exotic creatures that have always been elusive. The impenetrable rainforests of the Amazon basin have enveloped them. And yet, that once seemingly infinite habitat is now being denuded at a staggering rate. One century ago, just over half of the world's tropical forests, including the Amazon, were located in Latin America. Since then, loggers and farmers have cleared 20% of it. More than ever before, this territorial loss is placing phenomenal pressure on bird and wildlife numbers. It's a threat to survival that applies not only to individual creatures, but entire species. And it's a threat being felt all over South America. From the lush Pantanal of Brazil, to the once prolific wildlife reserves of the Galapagos. to the windswept plains of Patagonia. Creatures of the jungles and pampas, forced by both encroaching civilization and hunters to retreat. This then is their story, that of the many spectacular and elusive animals, birds and insects of South America and the threat to their territories. The Amazon Basin is one of nature's greatest masterpieces. Its thick upper foliage shelters an amazing abundance of life in all forms. From columns of leafcutter ants carrying foliage many times their own body weight, to the ornately plumaged male mannequin performing a tightly synchronized dance to court a female. From colonies of minute bats flying in formation through the heart of the forest. To agile tree snakes, blending with the leaves as they wait for prey. But theirs is a territory under attack. Creatures of all kinds, like the dancing deer, are suffering in Brazilian states like Rondonia. An invasion of settlers there is clear-cutting rainforest trees at such a pace that most will be wiped out within a decade. It's the world's greatest environmental tragedy with an ongoing impact on wildlife. One creature clearly in crisis is the king of the Amazon. the all-conquering jaguar. Once hunted as far as the southwestern states of the USA and northern Mexico, other jaguars thrived in Uruguay and the pampas of Argentina, but no more. 
by the mid-1900s, ranchers had shot them out. That same fate is taking place right now across the rest of Central and South America. Our researchers met hunter after hunter who boasted of their kills. One man showing photographs of the 125 jaguars he'd shot. Protective legislation has done little to stop them being shot on sight. Only in 18 reserves at the deepest depths of the Amazon are jaguar numbers being sustained. One reason they're still being slaughtered is because they are ruthless killers. As the biggest cat in the Americas by far, their prey includes domestic cattle. When they go on the prowl, they're likely to attack any of the large mammals that roam the rainforests, such as tapirs or capybaras. If big game is not at hand, they'll take to the water in search of a meal. Nothing is too large or too small for them, as this toad quickly discovers. Pressing on, the jaguar dives repeatedly, searching for fish and tortoises. He's an agile swimmer, a skill he's honed crossing the often flooded tributaries of the Amazon. Primarily nocturnal, the jaguar's daytime hunting is usually confined to early mornings or late afternoons as he avoids the heat of the day. He's a fearsome predator, aggressively guarding his catch against others of his species. Regrettably for this superb creature, the illegal trade of their beautiful skins still flourishes, and that, combined with deforestation and hunting by ranchers, is placing phenomenal pressure on their numbers. Other species in the Amazon are facing their own dangers. One relentless hunter is the boa constrictor. His prey today, a grey bush mouse. Using his powerful body muscles, he maneuvers upwards with great stealth. Then, with lightning ferocity, he strikes. Half the mass is swallowed instantly. The rest slowly drawn in. It's a protracted process some 20 minutes elapsing before all of the mass disappears to be digested over the next day. Another fearless hunter is the ocelot. Lighter than the jaguar, and with a more ornamental coat, he pursues small game, such as the crested howitzer. These colorful birds roost on the edges of tributaries of the Amazon. From that relatively safe perch, their only real danger comes when they fly into the surrounding rainforest. Long, sharp teeth and claws make the ocelot an excellent predator as the Howardson discovers.
as this ocelot feasts on his kill. His species is itself under threat from predators, namely man. In the 60s, a fashion for ocelot furs peaked with up to 130,000 imported into the USA each year. Ocelots have since been declared as being in danger of extinction, with the Brazilian government introducing tough protection laws. Despite that, the trade in ocelot furs has prospered, with some quarter of a million exported to Europe alone over one five-year period. Theirs is a diverse diet, their victims ranging from rodents and hares to lizards and frogs. But they're also keen climbers, where they'll prey on birds like parrotlets and macaws. Both species swarm to giant clay licks during the dry season, the parrotlets being the first to hit the embankment each morning. At this time of year, the birds eat the clay to help them digest all of the unripened fruit they've been eating. The clay is like a sticky medicine, the parrotlets clawing greedily at it before they're forced to move on. What's pressuring them to eat so quickly is the king of their species. Hundreds of red and blue macaws flock to this bank each day, racing each other to find a good perch. Problem is, the cliff face is not only vertical, it's slippery. Around the clay lick, the macaws survive in a complex social system. For instance, they'll take a partner for life. But significantly, as prolific as the macaws appear here, their species too is endangered. Hunting for export to the pet trade has brought macaws to the edge of extinction. One extraordinary species of the Amazon that's not quite as endangered is the tapir, the largest animal found in South America. They're a relative of the rhinoceros, who are never far from water and take to it whenever there's danger. This female of the species is a strong swimmer, flaunting her long, flexible snout to track down her baby. On shore, he's innocently content. But then, he too senses danger. Together, mother and child are far more secure. He's her only offspring, clad in an ornamental coat of white spots, which will disappear as he grows. Around mother, he's exuberant, affectionate. Playtime becomes mealtime, as mother's warm teat provides both nourishment and security. Well above this ground level encounter, another Amazonian drama is unfolding. It all begins innocently enough as a lineated woodpecker goes to work. Pecking feverishly with his powerful bill, 
he chisels out a perfect nesting site. It's at this point the villain appears. As we're about to witness, the toucan will use his own powerful beak to commit murder. He's targeted a hole just created by the woodpecker, barely enough for him to squeeze through. His first hole is without victims. Nest after nest is then checked out. Finally, he finds his target, some newly hatched chicks. It's a delicacy worth fighting for. And as another species of toucans demonstrates, the ritual of cannibalism is widely practiced. Nearby, a family of Cotamundis live together to heighten their chances of survival. Under attack, these highly intelligent, raccoon-like creatures will work together to bring down an opponent. Their preference, though, is to play harmlessly together. And their normal diet? The many large insects that litter the rainforest floor. Watching all these dramas unfold are the monkeys. From the safety of a canopy, a troop of squirrel monkeys swarm. Their problem is that they're too friendly thousands being captured some decades ago for overseas laboratories and zoos. What's remained is an Amazon alive with other monkey species. Large and small. Friendly and cautious. Theirs is a life of leisure, where even potential meals are pursued with nonchalance. For the red howlers, fruit is an easier meal than catching a bird. And hitching a ride is easier than walking. It's all so tiring. Far more energetic are the marmosets, the tiniest members of the monkey kingdom. There's the emperor tamarind, with his enormous droopy moustache. It's the male of the species who will care for the young, carrying them around all day. Then there's the beautiful golden lion tamarind, his orange mane making him appear far more ferocious than he really is. And finally, the cotton tops, regarded as so cute that thousands have been shipped to Europe. The other tree dweller that's earned his reputation is the sloth. He's the slowest creature on earth, so lethargic 
that he'll spend days on end lazing in the same position. Not only is their movement sluggish, but they also display little emotion, even over their youngsters. And when they do move, it's usually to hang upside down, a position they remain locked in, even when they die. The Pantanal of Western Brazil is a refuge of outstanding importance to wildlife. The sheer size of this inland swamp is such that a huge array of wild creatures find sanctuary here. And yet, that wildlife is now under threat on several fronts. High levels of mercury from gold mining, hunting, diseases, and loss of habitat through drainage of marshes for pasture and cultivation. Natural predation is taking its toll as well. The caiman of the Pantanal are both killers and, as we'll see shortly, victims in the daily law of the jungle fight for survival. They're particularly vulnerable once they've hatched from their shells. Baby caiman falling prey to both birds and other larger caiman. Their mortality rate would be even higher were they not endowed with the ability to change colour rapidly. A camouflaging technique that saves them from more attacks. Fully grown, they're formidable creatures. Their size and speed allow them to take a heavy toll on small game. One of their easiest targets are fish. Big groups often gather around small waterfalls where their prey is so abundant that it leaps into their mouths. Their biggest enemies, even when they grow to full size, are the many boa constrictors that haunt the swamps of the Pantanal. The world's largest living snake is also a keen swimmer, covering large distances in search of prey. Of all the boa's targets, the caiman appears to be the most invincible adversary. Dagger-like teeth and tough skin making him appear as the king of the Pantanal. But the boa has his own views. Using its incredibly powerful muscles, it raises itself high out of the water to look for an unsuspecting caiman. Without warning, it strikes. Before it knows what's hit it, the caiman is tightly wrapped up in a killer stranglehold. Death is almost instantaneous. The boa's grip so intense, it prevents the caiman's heart and lungs from functioning. The boa wastes no time in consuming his new kill. It unravels its coils, allowing it to move up to the caiman's head. At first, it tries to swallow the caiman in the water, but then decides to drag its dead adversary to the shoreline for a better grip. Here begins the amazing process of swallowing the caiman whole.
This the boa achieves by dislodging its jaws to suck in the caiman's entire body. Digesting that huge feed is achieved on the move. The boa slithers out of the reeds and inland to find a more secure place to sleep off its massive meal. Those caiman that escaped the boas stalked the Pantanal swamps in search of their own victims. It's a perfect environment to hunt the small game that comes down to the water's edge to drink. One of their favorite catches are capybaras, the world's largest rodent. Spotting a potential meal, the caiman moves in for the kill. But the capybara takes to the water, diving deep in a bid to escape. It's a tactic which, this time at least, pays off. But none of the creatures of the Pantanal can ever rest easy, even at night. Not the capybaras, who eat out in the midst of the waterways around the clock. Not the giant anteaters who forage incessantly for food. Not even the many species of frogs who blanket the water lilies. because lurking close to all of them are the killer caiman, their voracious appetites compelling them to hunt at all hours. Daylight reveals another of his victims, the giant otter. They're the largest otter in the world, longer than a small car, hunters of small animals and aquatic birds, and very vocal. This is their haunting call of distress, a danger signal being heard more and more frequently throughout the Pantanal as they too face death from both predators and the effects of man. No creature on the Pantanal better exemplifies man's harsh treatment than the giant anteater. The unmistakable profile of a mother carrying a baby on her back is a sight being seen less and less across much of South America. The arrival of man having already led to their extinction in many territories, such as Peru. Hunting and housing have wiped out tens of thousands of these sensitive creatures, their numbers further limited in that they give birth to only one baby at a time. Their bonding process is made all the more touching through the long time mother and child travel together an act that only ends once the youngster simply becomes too heavy to carry. Both will live off ants and termites, using their long snout to sniff out fresh supplies. Naturally enough, ant and termite nests are their favorite source of food. It's here the anteaters use their long, sharp claws to tear the earth apart. 
their tongue, more than a meter long and very sticky, then goes to work sucking in hundreds of insects at a time. It's a fascinating process, but one that is occurring less and less across South America as the number of anteaters continues to fall. One other creature of the Pantanal is suffering a similar fate. The same belts of armor that have protected the armadillo against predators until recent times are now leading to them being killed off. The hard bony scales sought after for bowls, containers and musical instruments. As well, many natives consider their meat a delicacy. This and increasing deforestation of their habitat means the larger species of armadillos is becoming very rare on the Pantanal. grassy plains of central Argentina, known as the Pampas, are a prime example of man's negative influence on wildlife. Small herds of rheas now roam on territory once claimed by thousands of these large flightless birds. That savage reduction is in direct proportion to the loss of grazing territory caused when horses and cattle were introduced to new estancias. During the breeding season, rivalry between the males is intense. Fights are frequent, the victor chasing off his challenger. The winner then embarks on displays of sheer grace, drooping his wings to the ground as a prelude to courting all of the females. The rears share the pampas not only with cattle, but with a number of other small hunters. The pampas fox usually chase small game in pairs. While the ungainly maned wolf are solitary predators. Both stalk and eat small rodents. Among them, the nutria, its soft fur prized by man. And the huron, a weasel that thrives in the vast grasslands. The pampas are also studded with many small lakes, providing prolific breeding grounds for bird life. South America has the most distinctive bird fauna of any of the continents. Four of the six species of flamingos occurring here. Pink spoonbills work the water's edge. while field flicker woodpeckers are active in whatever timber they can find. But the bird species that has been given wide acclaim is the minute hummingbird. They're both the world's smallest and most active birds, expending more energy for their size than any other warm-blooded animal. Every second their wings will flap up to 80 times, allowing them to suck nectar through their long tubular tongues. The hovering ability of this tiny dynamo 
is achieved by beating their wings backwards and forwards instead of up and down, a feat made possible by wings which swivel in all directions from the shoulder. But of all the fauna in the pampas, the hardiest are the deer. Several types have evolved, all smaller and stockier than their European cousins. Like the rheas, they're large and conspicuous enough to fall prey to hunters. Increasingly, their numbers are in decline as more and more of the estancias on the pampas are fenced off for crops. In terms of wildlife, they're unique. The Galapagos Islands, home to the world's most primitive creatures. Hundreds of species of birds, mammals, and reptiles have adapted and thrived in this inhospitable landscape. Yet their long-term safety is under threat on several fronts, from packs of feral dogs to new housing developments. The dogs have attacked many species, among them the most remarkable of all creatures here, the marine iguana. This prehistoric reptile is the world's only seagoing lizard. Although Darwin described them as hideous, sluggish and stupid, the marine iguana is a marvel of evolution, having adapted to the sea in a number of ways. A tail much flatter than the land species enables them to propel themselves through the water. Their nostrils allow them to expel seawater, the strong saline solution staining their head white and their sharp curved claws help them to cling to the slippery rocks where they feast on algae and seaweed. Away from the sea, in the dry, arid zones, live the land iguanas. These lizards grow as long as a medium-sized dog and survive on dry grass and prickly cactus plants. Their territory is also shared by more than half a million seabirds, including the world's largest concentration of boobies, varieties such as masked boobies and red-footed boobies thrive on these rocky inlets. But it's the blue-footed booby which has become one of the island's most famous residents. This peculiar dance is all part of their elaborate mating ritual. The male offers a twig to mark the foundations of their nest, a curious gesture considering the eggs will be laid on the bare ground. This nest-building ritual is evidence of the bird's ancestry, an instinct lost over time. A second male suitor attempts to woo the hen with an impressive display. Mating pairs remain together until the chicks are fully grown and all duties are shared equally between the two. At the shoreline, hundreds of blue-footed boobies circle in search of a meal. Once a fish has been targeted, the boobies plummet kamikaze style, taking their prey by surprise.
The frigate bird is another remarkable local. In the breeding season, males inflate the huge crimson sac in their throats to attract a mate. Once the female has chosen her mate, the pair will build a crude nest in either a tree or shrub and will share all duties until their chicks are reared. At feeding time, the frigate lives up to its name, circling high above the other birds like a great black warship. Then there's the brown pelican, a true master of flight who plummets vertically into the sea repeatedly to catch fish for up to three ravenous chicks. One species that takes the Galapagos in a very laid-back fashion is the fur seal. They're the best of playmates, at ease in the company of much larger sea lions. The largest of bulls generally wins dominance over a colony of cows and pups. While they frolic in sheltered rock pools, the bulls patrol their territory, watching for sharks and killer whales lurking near the shore. Theirs is a torrid existence. The senior bull claiming all of the females as his mating partner, but then losing his harem when challenged by a younger bachelor. But of all the marvellous species in this unique wilderness, it's the giant marine tortoise which has become the trademark of the Galapagos. These giant reptiles can live for over a hundred years. Their ability to fast for months on end has earned them the reputation as the great survivors of the sea. Ironically, it was this attribute that almost led to the extinction of the Galapagos tortoise, with sailors once capturing thousands of live ones to provide fresh meat over long journeys. Today, an intense breeding program is slowly restoring numbers, but like hundreds of other Galapagos species, mankind has already left a permanent scar. It's the forgotten end of the Earth, Patagonia. So close to the Antarctic is it, that snow covers its jagged limestone peaks. Icebergs stud its shores, while winds of ferocious strength whip its waters where so many birds and animals have been obliterated to the north, the very remoteness of this idyllic wilderness has resulted in the proliferation of many species. Conservation areas like Chile's Torres del Paine National Park are models of protection. Bird life unseen elsewhere thrives and multiplies and the only slaughter these days comes from natural predators. Foxes have reached healthy numbers, pursuing rodents and birds with vigor.
far more elusive are pumas. Across Patagonia, they hide out in thick vegetation, emerging at night to attack smaller game, like rabbits. While hunting pumas has now been banned across most of South America, landowners continue to bait them at a rate so alarming they have been wiped out in many areas. One species that's been more fortunate, at least in southern Patagonia, are guanacos, members of the camel family, but without the hump. They graze in relative peace across much of Patagonia, but not so their cousins, the llama and alpaca, who have been killed off in the wild. These days, the only llamas and alpacas to be found are in captivity, their ancestors having been domesticated by the Incas and used to haul loads. That's left these guanacos and their smaller cousin, the vicuna. But even the vicuna came close to extinction only three decades ago, when ruthless slaughter for their fine wool cut their numbers to just 6,000. Such widespread killings makes the plight of the guanaco all the more critical. Because they can't be domesticated, their only way of surviving is in the wild. But with their territory continuing to shrink across much of South America, Patagonia has become their land of survival. The creation of large parks and rigid policing along the Andes has saved the guanaco from extinction, with numbers at last on a healthy rise. Feasting on the sweet grass that covers much of Patagonia is their preferred pastime. But they're surprisingly active, particularly the youngsters. Adolescent males chase one another to assert their authority. The dominant male will get to mate with and control all of the females. Baby guanacos, born in the warmth of summer, are abundant, suckling their mother for the first few months of their life. Immersing themselves in dust is also common. It's their own form of insect control, the fine powder helping to eradicate fleas and nits. But despite their relative safety in Patagonia, Guanacos remain ever vigilant, acting skittishly at the slightest threat. It takes just one frisky youngster to set off the herd. One of their perceived threats are the many condors that patrol the skies above them. The Andean condor is the largest flying bird in the world so massive that it's been known to snatch a newborn guanaco from its mother. From his cliffside retreat, he surveys potential meals below. Like all vultures, the condor is a carrion feeder, preferring to wait until animals die before he feeds. In flight, he's one of the most specialized birds aloft, his wings almost motionless as he rides the thermals to great heights. Back to Earth, 
our final sensation in South America, is truly heartwarming. We're about to witness the power that love has on all members of the Guanaco herd. It begins with the act of lovemaking, the dominant male mounting an estrus female. The excitement attracts first one inquisitive youngster, then another. Within minutes, all of the herd is running in. The copulating couple are surrounded. It's as if they're supporting and protecting the lovers. For almost an hour, the guanacos huddle together, displaying no sense of urgency. Their gathering is one of great sensitivity and beauty, creating not only another member of this guanaco herd, but also a wider hope that in this land of intense pressures on all species, this one, at least, will survive.